Daniel Truman was an older guy I used to work with. All things considered, he was a decent person, though. He was one of those folks who had a story for about any occasion. Almost anything that anyone else may have experienced, he had a tale to top it. It could be annoying at times, but I don't believe he ever meant any harm. Perhaps he only craved being in the spotlight for a while. Maybe he had a few insecurities, which could potentially have been momentarily erased by making himself the center of attention for a time. Regardless of his reasons, little to nobody actually believed his supposed recollections, as the majority of them sounded to be quite fictional. Oftentimes, he could successfully gain the respect of the new hires, or even some who had worked there for a while, who may not be all that familiar with him and his ways. Though he could tend to spin a well-crafted yarn, I would feel my eyes rolling when he would take it upon himself to repeat the same tales over and over again, depending on his respective audience at the time. He was getting up there in years, so it cannot be denied that it was somewhat impressive that he would recite one verbatim, whether he had only told it the day before or half a decade ago. Still, I highly doubted he truly had done everything from thwarting an attempted bank robbery with no more than his expertise in the martial arts to witnessing the extraterrestrial ship crashing down onto Roswell. I can't say I didn't have a fondness for the mad old bastard, though. Sure, his ways could quickly get under my skin when I was simply not in the mood for his endless rambling, but I would just sneak away when I wasn't feeling it. More often than not, I would humor him with the mandatory one-word replies or the occasional oohs and ahs, and his tales would reach their climax. I may even grant him an enthusiastic, holy shit, if I was in the mood to butter his popcorn a bit. He was harmless, really, and he would get a glint in his eye like a kid on Christmas morning when any of us would eat up the crap he was attempting to feed us. It wasn't until the day I returned to work after a two week sabbatical due to my father's passing when he told me a story I actually believed and still do to this day. On any normal day, he would practically perform his tales, darting his eyes between each person in the room, gesturing with his hands to increase the intensity while dramatically pausing, in between raising and lowering the tone of his voice to fit the subject matter, but not this one. On this occasion, he didn't so much glance in my direction while he spoke in an almost monotone voice. Another unique component to this one was that he would actually pause when anyone entered the office. Generally, he would backtrack to catch the new audience member up to speed, but it would seem this one was for me and me alone. I wasn't exactly in the best mindset when I arrived back at work that day. Though my father had battled cancer for the better part of three years, it was still a shock when he finally lost the fight. I'd always been close to my parents, so I'd spend a majority of those 14 days off the job caring for my mother while taking little time to allow myself to face my own grief. She was slowly coming back to herself, but she'd suffered almost as much as her husband over the past years. Perhaps more so. In some ways, she was actually relieved the fight was over, but she was still without her soulmate, regardless of the fact that he would no longer have to suffer. My fellow employees from the previous shift were still in the office when I arrived. Each gave me their sympathies while making the token inquiries as to how I was holding up and such, but I wanted little more than to be left alone. Though I appreciated the well wishes and condolences, I was not in a mood to talk about it. And after they filtered out, leaving me alone with Truman, I just headed to my desk, keeping my head lowered in an attempt to convey how much I didn't want to talk about things. For the first few hours, he respected my need for silence. It wasn't until I returned from my bathroom break that he began to speak. I was 12 when I lost my pop. I felt my neck tense up, instantly feeling anger pulse through my veins. 
Surely he didn't feel the need to one-up me on something like this, I thought, while keeping my back turned to the man in an effort to encourage him to cease his desire to get a win on something like this. I know you're hurting, kid. Just tell me to shut the hell up if you don't want to hear me ramble on. There was something sincere in his voice. Something compassionate and genuine I had never heard from him. I turned my chair around to face the man, only to find he still had his back to me. Though I truly had no desire to hear some far-fetched yarn, perhaps concerning how his youthful frame was far too weak to successfully wrestle the alligator into submission as it chewed on his daddy's throat, his tone and mannerisms were, were far from the norm. I found myself quite curious to what he had to say. Ramble away, I said with a very false and forced chuckle. He returned an equally imitated laugh before he began to speak again. The story he shared with me that day has stayed with me these past few years. A tale I'd like to share with all of you now, should you have interest in hearing it. I would try to the best of my ability to recount words as he spoke them, though I can't promise it'll be a hundred percent to the letter. Still, I will not exaggerate, nor will I inflate his words to anything more grandiose than they were. The following is the last story Daniel Truman ever shared with me. It was a small town I lived in with my folks back then. Far smaller than this one. A little place called Rimrose Fall, a couple of hundred miles to the south of here. It wasn't nothing special, but I had never been anywhere else when I was young. Mom had some ailments, ain't no need of speaking of, but she'd have me going into the city every few weeks ago to see some better doctors than the one we had back home. Pappy had been promising to take me fishing for the last month or so, but... It had been hard to find the time between Mama and his work. We'd go from time to time, but it was a good drive to get to the lake he favored, so we'd always have to plan it out pretty good. I'd ask him, sometimes, why couldn't we just head up to Boulder Creek, being that it was just a couple of miles from where we lived, but he'd tell me we had no business going there. He said there were some local fishermen types that didn't take too kindly to others taking up their spot though I'd never seen no one else when we'd passed it by in Pappy's truck. He wouldn't hear it, though. Made me swear I'd never even think about going out there, but I didn't understand at the time. You know how it is when you're that age. Got everything figured out by then. Can't nobody tell you otherwise. That Thursday, May 16th, 1968, Pop set it up where he was going to go spend the whole day with me. He was going to take off work, said we'd go fishing and just have a good old time, just the two of us. He was even going to let me skip out of going to the schoolhouse just so we could have some father-son time in. I was plumb thrilled, and it was all I thought about for the two weeks that went by after he told me. Mama had seen a doctor the week before the 16th, so she should have been good while we was gone. Of course, her situation was mighty unpredictable, so when we got to that Thursday and she took a turn... Pappy didn't have no choice but to take her back into the city. He told me he was sorry. I could tell he meant it on account of he was looking forward to catching some fish too. Still, I can't say I wasn't none too thrilled about how it turned out. I didn't pitch a fit or nothing, but I didn't exactly put on an understanding face either. Pop told me I didn't have to come with him to see the doctor, even though I'd already taken the school day off, but he promised we'd get that trip soon. Just had to prioritize the important things. You could tell I was upset, but I didn't take no measures to convince him or Mama otherwise. I know it wasn't her fault, and I knew she was in bad shape when she took a turn, but I must have came off like 
a damn brat at the time. Pop looked plumb sad when he helped Mama to the truck, and I'm sure I could have made him feel better if I'd done some sort of effort, but I didn't. I still feel bad for that to this day, but I know I was just a kid. I mean, you know better, though. I was still moping around the house a good hour after they took off. It had been some time since I'd last got to go fishing. When I looked back at the tackle box we'd already set out the front door, I just had my mind made up before I'd even registered. Boulder Creek was only a ways from the house, and I could load the box and fishing pole onto my bike and could be there and back before anyone was the wiser. I knew my folks would likely not be back until after sundown, so I could surely catch a few and still be back before they knew it. I reckon I was about as stubborn as a mule and hard-headed as an ox, so I didn't care that Pappy had made me promise to never go there. I figured he just didn't trust me enough to be able to get around all the wild brush and such out there without hurting myself, so he made some stuff up to keep me from going. I strapped a tackle box to the back of the bike with some old belts I'd grown out of and used some twine to tie around the pole, sling it over my shoulder. I even strapped the bowie knife I'd gotten for Christmas to my belt just in case I had to scare off some critters or something. It was a bit awkward to ride with the box and the rod, but it was nothing I couldn't deal with. The trail was rough, and I damn near tipped over on some of the lumberier parts. Before I knew it, I was clearing the trees that surrounded the creek. I had never seen it up close, only from the road of the hill. It sure was pretty. It was almost a perfect circle with thinner streams branching off here and there in the middle. There was a small mound of dirt with a giant rock sticking out of it. I suppose that's how it got the name Boulder Creek, though it's a uh, mite unoriginal given the island made of stone. The water looked as clear as if you'd poured it from a jug, and I could see fish zigging and zagging under the surface, or no wild underbrush either. I could see no bottom to the lake, but the water was clear as far as my youthful eyes could see. Still, I wasn't the best swimmer, so I wasn't going to let myself get too close to it for nothing. I wasn't that curious to see how deep it went. While I got to unloading the tackle box, pulling the twine from the rod and baiting the hook, I kept looking around for any sign the locals Pop warned me about. Given this was only a short ways from the house, I didn't see no reason why I wouldn't be considered a local, but I still didn't see no sign of anyone. The grass was overgrown in between patches of flat dirt and rocks, and it didn't look as if nobody had been out this way in weeks at least. There wasn't no bent blades or footprints. Hell, I couldn't even hear no sign of wildlife nearby except for the fish under the water. There were no crickets jumping, no squirrels running. Up and down the trees, no birds flapping around in the woods up in the sky above me. It was kind of peaceful, but a bit eerie, too. Everything being so quiet but me. Still, I went ahead with what I was there for and cast my line out into the creek. I could see the fish scatter as soon as the hook dropped in on them. So I took a seat on the tackle box and stayed as still as a deer in headlights. I figured they'd gather back up once they felt it was nothing to be scared of. I was going to toss back whatever I caught anyway. Couldn't go bringing any fish back to the house when I was done. Didn't want Pop to know I disobeyed him. He wasn't never one to tan my hide unless I really had it coming, but I figured this give me a good whooping on account of he made me promise and all. My boots were getting good and muddy too, so I figured I'd either clean them up when I got back or just tell him I was playing around outside. Surely he'd have no reason to suspect otherwise. When I finally got my first bite, I swear I had to wrestle that bitch for a good ten minutes straight. When I reeled her in, she had to be a good six pounds at least, maybe a foot and a half long. It might be no more than average for some, but it was the biggest sucker I'd ever seen at that age. After I let that go, I didn't have much luck. The biggest I'd reeled in after that was maybe a pound or two, but I'd pulled a good five or six from the lake before the sun started to sink. I knew I had to be getting back, but I wish I could told Pappy about how many I'd caught. I just knew if I could convince him to come out, we could have supper for a month. Still, I wasn't about to confess I did what he said not to. 
After I got the tackle box strap back down and I was tying the twine back to the fishing pole, I heard a whimpering coming from nearby. It's been so damn quiet, I'd taken to keeping my breathing shallow and damn near tiptoeing around. You know how it is. Even when you got no reason to be quiet, you kind of act like it when there ain't no sounds other than you. That's why the sound damn near caused my heart to skip. Like I said, the grass was grown out pretty tall and nothing had been cut down or maintained so I couldn't see nothing from where the whimpering was coming from, even though it sounded like it was just some yards behind me. Being as curious as any kid that age, I had to see what was causing it. Closer I got, the more it sounded like another kid crying. I hadn't seen no one else the whole time I'd been there, but I hadn't looked around much either. It scared me something awful to think there might have been someone out there hurt or passed out while I was having a good old time none the wiser. Could be they just started to come too as I was getting ready to set off back home. All manner of things was going through my head the closer I got. It was until I was right on to where the whimper was coming from that it stopped. I swatted at the tall grass and was cutting my eyes this way and that but there weren't no sounds no more but me. As soon as I shrugged the whole thing off and made my way back to the bike, I noticed I couldn't lift my legs no more. I looked down, pushed in the grass away so I could see my feet to see some sort of light shining from beneath me. Damn near pissed my pants when I saw the shadowy hands gripped around my shoes too. Must have been five or six of them. Just tiny little hands gripping onto feet and ankles. I hollered out as loud as I could while I was pulling at my legs, trying to break them free from the tight gripped fingers, but I couldn't so much as yank my feet out of my shoes. I didn't stop screaming out with every bit of my lungs, even when the hands pulled me down into the other place. Didn't even feel like I went through grass and dirt as much as there just wasn't no ground beneath my feet for a minute. Knocked myself out cold when I hit the other ground that was beneath the one I was on before. As soon as it came to, I started hollering again. I didn't know if I was still asleep and dreaming or if the giant shadow man who stood over me was real. It's bigger than anything I'd ever seen before with bright red glowing eyes. It was the only thing I could make out on him, on account of the rest being no more than a shadow. I didn't see no sign of the little ones whose hand pulled me through from up top, just the big and staring at me. I was still whimpering some even after my yells gave out. The thing still looked down on me, tilting its head from this one side to another, but I don't think he was the one that was making the odd sounds I was hearing. It was some sort of clicking or snapping in a way. It was dark and kind of foggy all around me, but I could still make out a little. The walls had looked as if they was wood, but the grains didn't flow like no wood I'd ever seen. It ain't easy to explain, but things wasn't shaped like they are here, you know? It looked like there were four walls, but also if there was more. Couldn't see no sort of ceiling, and the ground I was laying on didn't feel like nothing natural or man-made. Clicking sounds was all around me. No matter where I turned my head, I couldn't see where it was coming from, even though it sounded like it was right beside me. As soon as the shadow thing wrapped its hand around both my legs and lifted me from the floor, my bladder couldn't hold back no more. The thing had to be ten times my height at the time. It was kind of small for my age, but I still hadn't never seen none this big. While I dangled in front of the shadow man's red eyes, I could make out more of its features, though that ain't saying much. It had jet black skin. Sort of plain face. Normal enough nose and mouth and all, but when it licked its lips while it stared me down, I could see that even its tongue and teeth were black. It was like looking at a negative picture or something. On top of that, from high where I was hanging, I could make out more of what stood under me. This will likely sound even crazier than a 20-foot shadow man, but I swear to the good lord, they looked like man-sized praying mantis. It was hidden behind that odd haze that made the one that held me 
was like nothing more than a shadow at first, so it was hard to focus my eyes on him. Could be that there was nothing more than some men folk in costume, but they didn't move like no man I'd ever seen. Can't rightly say whether the one that held me or the giant bugs clicking at each other had me more unsettled, but I was sure I was done for it nonetheless. Felt like the biggin moved in slow motion almost, but it still hurt something awful when he slapped my body onto some sort of hard slab then growed out of the ground before my eyes. Knocked the wind out of me too. When he stood back up, he was like nothing more than a shadow again. But the mantis thing moved in closer where I was laying. One of them was holding some sort of chains or straps or something. Then the other hand, some odd looking tools of some kind. One of them looked like pliers my pop had in the garage. And the other reminded me of needles a doc would stick in my mama's arms. But it wasn't no made of metal or glass I'd ever seen. I was shivering from my head to my toes and squalling as loud as I could. I was sure no one or nothing could hear me, but I was screaming for help anyways. I heard what sounded like a blade being sharpened from somewhere in the darkness. It dawned on me I still had my bowie strapped to that belt. Pappy told me to be extra careful when he'd given it to me for Christmas on account of the edge he'd ground it to. He shaved the hairs off his arm to show me how sharp it was. Sure enough, it left a shiny bald spot on his forearm in a second or two. As soon as one of those giant bugs made a pull at the strap over my chest, I pulled my blade and swiped it across its arm or leg or whatever it was that held it out. Whatever it was, I cut it short and it let out a squeal like I had never heard. The other one came at me and I stuck it with my blade too, carved into whatever sort of flesh it had like a hot stick of butter. Both of them were hollering themselves now, and the big and came reaching for me. As soon as I dodged to the side, which weren't none too hard on account of how slow it moved, I heard a sort of muffled yell coming from outside of that room. It was hard to tell. With it coming from what I supposed to be the outside of the world, but it sounded like someone was calling my name. I didn't see no doors or much of nothing else, and I couldn't tell what direction the voice was coming from, so I just screamed out, I'm in here, as loud as I could. I just kept hollering out the same words over and over while dodging the big guy and swatting at him with my bowie. As soon as I run the blade across the hand, it stretched out, causing it to squeal out in another unsettling sort of sound. I saw something else that damn near turned my hair white. Maybe ten feet over the spot I was laying on when I came to, I saw a normal enough human-looking arm reaching through a sort of blue glowing hole. The mantis whose arm was a bit shorter now was helping the other one back up from the floor, so I knew I didn't have long. Without even thinking, I run for the hole. I leapt for the hand as soon as I got within range, but I missed it and fell back onto the ground. I ain't sure if this will make any sense. Hell, I ain't sure if none of this makes any kind of sense, but that clicking sound was a lot more aggravated than it was before. It was both coming at me. The big one was coming back into view behind me, too. The one I stuck wasn't moving fast, and neither was the shadowy thing, but the other was charging pretty good. I jumped up again, but I couldn't get within a shout of the hand that was dangling down from elsewhere. I was going to have to get a running start and hope to get close enough. With the big one on one side and the bugs on the other, I was running out of options. I just run straight at the mantis that was charging me. I swung my blade from side to side just hoping I could get it to back off. My pants were still soaked on account of my bladder giving out but my tiny legs were still scurrying like a mouse. As soon as my bowie made contact with the gut of the giant bug, it hit the ground, clutching at its middle. The other wasn't far behind it, but it stopped in place while I was still waving the knife around like a madman. I saw the big and reach for the arm that was poking through the hole, so I didn't have no more time to waste. I just run as fast as I could. When I got close enough, I jumped as high as my legs could take me. I grabbed onto the arm with both hands, letting my knife hit the ground. I didn't mean to drop it. 
but I didn't want to risk not holding on tight enough. And I'm sure enough didn't want to poke it into the one that was trying to pull me out. Before I knew it, I was laying on the tall grass, panting and wheezing worse than I did the first time I smoked a cigarette. While I lay there catching my breath, my pappy pulled me in close, gripping me tight, not letting go. As soon as I realized it was his arm, what poked through the doorway between this place and the other, I got scared he'd holler at me for not listening. It seemed all he cared about at the time was that I was alright. I was still shaking all over, crying, my eyes red, so was he, truth be told. I was saying I was sorry over and over, but he just held me tight, rubbing my back. I think he was trying to calm me down, but he was as tore up as I was dark out by this point, so I didn't know how long I'd been down there, nor how long he might have been looking for me. I figure he got home, seen the tackle box gone. Luckily, it didn't take him long to put together where I got off to. He was always a smart one, my pop. Once he got me calmed down, he patted me on the back and told me to go on and get on my bike. I held up for a minute to wait for him, but he told me to go on home, and he'd be there shortly. At first, I thought he was fixing to jump back down in that hole and show the monsters a thing or two, but even as strong as my pappy was, I thought that'd be a bad idea. Until I got close to the edge of the creek when I looked back to see him just watch me with a smile on his face. It wasn't a normal smile, though. Still had tears dripping down, but there was something else in his face I couldn't figure out. We just stared at each other for a minute or two before he just closed his eyes. As soon as it hit me what was happening, I charged back over to where he stood, rooted in place. It was maybe a few feet from him when he got pulled under. I dug around the ground where he sat hugging and crying, but... It was only dirt and grass. Wasn't well, no sign of any sort of hole or entrance to the other place. I still clawed at the ground till my fingernails bent back and my skin tore. I was hollering and wailing again, but there weren't no sign of him nor where he'd went. Seems whatever door he pulled me out of had closed as soon as he went through it. I rode back home faster than I knew I could. Maybe it took me half the time to get back than I had to get out of the creek in the first place. I told my mama what had happened and she was all kind of shook. I called the sheriff to come out, but I didn't know if he could help with something like this. He was an older feller, likely as old as I am now, but he didn't seem to think kindly about going out to Boulder Creek. I was pitching a fit and mama was causing a fuss too, so he finally gave in and headed up the trail with Deputy Mills. He was half the age of the sheriff, but he came off like his shit smelled pretty. Looked down his nose at me and Mama as if we ain't got no right call on him. Still, he didn't look none too thrilled about going up to the old creek either, but the trail was wide enough for the car to get him close before they had to go on foot the rest of the way. Wouldn't let me or Ma come with him on account of being unsafe if a crime had been committed. Still wanted to go, but I couldn't leave Mama alone. She was all manner of upset, and I was still tore up myself. I didn't even think they would even know what to look for, but I didn't trust them to put a lot of work into looking. It was likely around midnight when they came back, but they didn't turn up nothing. I figured they wouldn't, but they had dried mud and dirt under their fingernails and covering their shirt and pants, so it looked as though they'd at least tried. More than I thought they would, anyways. Both of them looked plum rattled, and the deputy was white as a ghost. They had me fill out some paperwork, but they read like I was kind of crazy when I read it back. Sheriff told me he'd get together a search party and do what they could to find Pop, but they never did turn nothing up. Where nobody found or nothing, it was like he just vanished from this earth altogether. He warned me to never go into the city to see the dock. Never found much of nothing neither, but every now and then when I would just sit in the still quiet of the place, I could swear and hear something call from somewhere as far away. 
Could have just been my mind playing tricks on me, though. I've always told myself I'd go back that way again someday. It's my fault he got pulled down there in the first place. I should have listened in when he told me not to go there, but I was just too damn hard-headed to hear it. I know I ain't got no one to blame but myself for what happened, but Mom never blamed me, not once. She mourned for my pop, but she still loved me with her whole heart until he gave up. I still hold on to the hope that Pappy found my bowie knife and hacked them things to bits before they could strap him down to that slab. I know it left him hurting a good bit, but I don't know about that big end or whatever them little hands was, neither. It could be that he's still down there for a way out. Even if he'd be pushing 90 by now, he was the toughest some bitch I ever knew. He would never go out without taking them with him. I know this story sounds like the ramblings of a mad old man. Lord knows I've told more than my share of wild ones over the years, and I ain't got no doubt you know I was full of shit on most of them. He was always kind enough to play along when I'd spend the same old yarns time after time, and I couldn't thank you enough for that kid. It was never the same after I lost my pop, and I suppose still got a screw or two loose, but you never made fun of me or showed me no sort of disrespect. You're a good kid. Appreciate you humoring me this one last time. And all the crap I've fed you over the years, I can neither ask nor expect you to believe this one to be true, but hand to God, this one may be the only truth I've ever told. I ain't ever seen no aliens, and I for damn sure couldn't fight off no armed robbers to save my life, but there's some things out there, kid. Some things we weren't ever meant to see or meet. I can't rightly say where that creek sent me to that day, nor where my pappy ended up, but to this day, I still wish I had answers to it all. I'm sure I ain't got too many years left ahead of me, and I sure as hell ain't getting no younger. Always wondered what I'd find if I just kept digging, though. I don't think there was so much under the earth as under the world. Somewhere's under the surface of what we know to be. Maybe, though. Maybe, I'll. We were interrupted by the graveyard shift coming in. And I'd never had a chance to find out where that sentence would lead. Before he headed out for the night, Truman clapped me on the shoulder and shook my hand. He said he was truly sorry for my loss and told me to take care of myself. There was something more genuine in his voice than I'd ever heard. Somehow I think I knew that would be the last time I saw him. Had one final story almost felt like a confession he needed to get off his chest and I feel proud that he entrusted those last words to me. He never handed in a notice nor did he just outright quit the job he'd held for the better part of 20 years. He just didn't come in the next day nor any that followed. There was no obituary, no funeral, simply no signs of where he went but I had a feeling I knew what his destination had been after he clocked out that one last time. His wife had died some years back and his two sons had moved away for college, so nobody knew much of anything about where Daniel Truman's future carried him. Some time back, I considered taking a road trip to his old homestead to look for answers, but I could find absolutely no information on the town of Rimrose Fall, let alone the creek which sat some miles behind it. Maybe I didn't look hard enough, or didn't entirely want to be tempted to follow up where such a quest would lead me. There are some mysteries out there that are best left unsolved. Still, as completely out there as his story was, I believe every single word to this day. It could be that he just changed the name of the town to prevent me from temptation, of course, it most certainly could have been no more than just another tall tale he told me that day, one last bizarre product of an imaginative mind, just one more for the road, but I didn't think so. Not this one. I like to camp and fish from time to time, but I never retreat to the more secluded spots of the world anymore. 
Maybe I'm just a gullible idiot or a little bit intimidated about the possibilities, but maybe not. Perhaps we are a little more than fish in a barrel to those who dwell underneath should we be unfortunate enough to cross into their territory. I did purchase a fairly hefty bowie knife from when I do take those trips out into the woods. Well, that along with my pistol. Never hurts to be prepared, after all. I truly hope that Daniel Truman is out there somewhere, bending the ear of many who have grown as tired of his tales as I had at one time. For most I have crossed paths with over the years, I would wish them well and hope they find what they're looking for in life, but not Truman. I hate to think what he may have found if he did go search for it. When I came back from the restaurant's bathroom, there was a strange man sitting with my family. My first thought was that he was a waiter, or even the manager. It seemed like a very nice restaurant. The bathroom had been large and beautiful, with dark marble floors, mirror the length of the walls, and a small elderly man seated in the corner to offer towels and mints. And the area where we sat was... Wait, what did any of that matter? Who was this man sitting with my family? He wasn't dressed like he was part of the waitstaff. They all wore blue blazers, and he was wearing a dark gray suit, so either a manager or... His eyes lifted to mine at my approach, and I felt a dim twinge of... something at his gaze. Fear? Recognition? Did I know this man? I didn't think so, but... This was all so strange. Not just the man himself, but how everyone at the table was acting. Even before he'd noticed me, the man was just looking around silently, not talking to Cassie or the kids like I'd expect him to be if he'd been invited, or if he invited himself to sit down with strangers. He wasn't paying them much attention at all, in fact. Cassie and our two little girls were staring at him, though. Not saying or doing much of anything, just staring as though they knew he didn't belong, but weren't quite sure what to do about it. Frowning, I finished closing the distance to the table and looked down at him. Can I help you, sir? He just looked at me for a second as though weighing something. And when he finally did speak, I felt another wave of what I thought might be deja vu washing over me. Do you know who I am? I wanted to respond, but then I hesitated. Did I know him? Should I? Something pushed back against these thoughts as anger flared in my belly. No. I'm here to have a nice dinner with my family, and this... This intruder comes and starts freaking them out and asking me questions? Scowling down at him, I shook my head. No, I don't, and I'd like to know what you're doing at our table. I saw what seemed to be a pained look pass across his face briefly as he let out a sigh. Just... Just sit down and I'll try to explain. When I didn't move, he gestured to the empty chair next to him. Please. My stomach twisted in on itself as I looked around the room. There were another eight or ten tables full of customers all around, to say nothing of the waiters moving to and fro between them. No one seemed to notice the man at our table or be generally looking in our direction, so either he hadn't done anything too strange or bad before I came out, or he was supposed to be there. Just like I was. And if there was some kind of trouble or problem, maybe I should hear him out. Swallowing, I sank into the empty chair. 
Nodding, he folded his hands in front of him and stared down at them. What do you think you're doing here? I raised an eyebrow. Well, I'm trying to have dinner with my wife and children. I glanced over at Connie and tried to give her a comforting smile. Turning back to him, I went on. Look, what's going on? He looked up when I mentioned my family, his eyes following mine to where Cassie was silently watching. So, these things, they look like... They look like your wife and kids to you. Do you remember having a wife and kids? I stared at him numbly. Well, of course I do. Expression darkening, he leaned toward me. Tell me about them. When I went to argue, he raised a hand and spoke again in a softer tone. Please. Humor me. Licking my lips, I gave a dry laugh. I don't see what this has to do with anything, but if this will get it over with, fine. I gestured toward my youngest. This is Casey. She's five years old, just started kindergarten, didn't you, sweetheart? Shifting over to the girl sitting next to her, I continued. And this is Penelope. She pl- How did you pronounce her name? Penelope. Why? You're not pronouncing her name right. Do you realize that? You're saying Pene like the pasta and Lope like a dog running across the field. Penelope. Gave me a small, tight grin. Like how a kid says it before they know how to pronounce it. I felt an uncomfortable stir of confused anger and shot him a dark look. I'm saying it right. Penelope. It's pronounced Penelope. My face reddened. I gave a defiant shrug. Whatever. People say things different ways, but quit changing the subject. Why are you... What about your... I saw a look of disgust across his face. Your wife. Tell me about her. Despite my growing irritation and fear, I found myself wanting to answer his questions. Licking my lips, I gave another smile. She's... A wonderful... She works with numbers. Man raised an eyebrow. Works with them how? My heart was beating faster as I racked my brain. I knew what my wife did for a living. Of course I did, but... What was it called? I needed to answer so this strange, terrible, mocking man would go away and leave us alone. Uh, she's a counter. Cassie helps people with businesses and stuff. An accountant. I nodded, a palpable sense of relief flooding me. Yeah, that's what it's called, an accountant. Connie's one of those. He'd been staring in her direction, but his eyes cut back to mine. Connie? I thought you said her name was Cassie. I felt my mouth drifting open as the panicky uncertainty began clawing in my insides again. Yeah, uh... Did I say Connie? I, I meant Cassie. I just must have messed up. I laughed awkwardly. <laughs> it's uh, been a long day, I guess. Has it been? What were you doing before you got here? I gave a start. What? He gestured around the restaurant. Before you and... Well, you and your family. Before you all came here tonight. Where were you? What were you doing? What do you mean? Leaning forward, he gripped my arm tightly. You know what I mean, Johnny. Do you remember anything before coming to this restaurant? Any place or event before coming here? 
I tried to pull away weakly as I stammered my response. I... My name's not Johnny. I, I, I don't have to answer your questions. Who are you anyway? He squeezed my arm harder. I'm... No. They said I don't have to do it like a story. Said I'd lose you if I just say it. You have to remember on your own. Glancing around again, I let out a hiss. You're crazy. No one else is paying attention, maybe, but when I start yelling, they sure will. If you don't want that to happen, you better leave us alone right now. I lowered my eyes as I made my threat, but when I looked up again, instead of seeing fear or anger in the man's face, I saw his terrible sadness. His eyes were shining as he gave my arm a gentler squeeze and then wiped his eyes. I remember that. It's not paying attention, it's paying attention. You... He stopped himself and let out a sigh. Look, let me tell you a story. And if that doesn't make you remember anything or understand why I'm here, I'll leave the table, okay? I give a small shrug. Fine. Tell me whatever you want to tell me. He nodded and began. When I was a kid, 13 or so, I lost my little brother. He... He was my best friend. He was only 17 at the time, but he was cool, you know? The age difference didn't matter to us, and we hung out every day. During the summers, we'd go off together all day sometimes, fishing or walking town or... finding out-of-the-way places to explore. One day we found this old, decrepit gas station out in the middle of nowhere. Now, when I say the middle of nowhere, I mean just that. We weren't on a road or anything. It was stuck out in the woods with nothing more than a pig path leading to it. And while it did look old and rotten, even at 13, I knew enough to see that it wasn't so old that the road leading to it would have been completely eaten up by time and forest. It was in the wrong place. And the place itself felt wrong, too. I wasn't going to take us in. I know that sounds like a cop-out, but I really wasn't. But my brother, he was really excited about it. He knew it was weird, too, of course. He was young, but pretty smart for his age. But where the strangeness of it all made me nervous and scared, it seemed to excite him. He wanted to go in to check it out. I told him we could get in trouble, that it was trespassing. But he was already shaking his head, said it was way too old for anyone to own it or care. Said the only reason I didn't want to go in was if I was too scared. I should have told him no. He wouldn't have liked it, but he would have listened to me. We were friends, but I was still his older brother. Still responsible for keeping us safe. And he knew that too. He trusted me, and when I said no and meant it, he listened to me. But I was stupid and weak. I loved how much he looked up to me, and I didn't want him to think I was too chicken to go into an old run-down building just because it was weird and creepy. Back then, it was hard for me to like myself sometimes, and seeing me the way he saw me, well, I was more scared of losing that than just about anything, I guess. So I took his hand and we went into the building. At first, it just seemed like what it looked like. There was broken glass, rusty metal shelves, counters, and a register covered with a thick layer of dirt and grime. We poked around in that ruin for a few minutes before things started to change. The air got warmer, for one. It had been a hot day already, but... The air inside that place had gone from slightly muggy to boiling hot in less than a minute. The air seemed thicker, too. Like you were pushing through water more than air. It was uncomfortable enough that when I said it was time to go, my brother didn't argue. We were halfway to the door when we first saw the worms. 
They were all of three or four feet long, fat and wriggling as they crawled out of the walls and shadowy corners of the place. Their skin was bright green and peppered with dark spots that looked like small spines or crusty places under their too tight bulges. They looked kind of like caterpillars in some ways, but they were banded and thicker in the middle like a magnet, the ends tapering to small points that seemed to have no face other than mouths that bit at the air as they rolled and writhed in our direction. We were terrified, and I tried to get us out. I kept a hold of my brother's hand until I cleared the door, but then he was snatched away. I turned back, was going to go back for him, I swear, but when I tried to enter again, I couldn't. The thickening air turned into a wall now, and I couldn't do anything as I watched him. As I watched him get pulled back into the dark of that place. I was still screaming and beating on the invisible something holding me back, and then I was waking up. The sun was lower in the sky now, and I was lying on the grass outside of the gas station. Where the gas station had been. Because now it was gone. I spent the net. You left me. I could hear the sad anger in my voice, even as my eyes began to fill with tears. I didn't understand what I was saying, not exactly, but somehow I knew it was right all the same. You left me. The words just oozed from me, thick and painful like pressure escaping a suddenly too tight wound. The man had stopped mid-sentence, the air seeming to have gone out of him as he stared at me, his lower lip trembling. Starting to shake his head, he leaned forward, his voice barely above a whisper. I swear, I never stopped looking for you, Johnny. It's, it's been 23 years, but I never stopped trying. I never gave up. Never, never forgave myself for not keeping you safe. He swallowed as he lowered his gaze. But I never got anywhere. Never even understood what I was really looking for, if I'm honest. frowned at him. And how did you find me? He shook his head. In the end, I guess it was luck. Fate. I don't know. I... I helped these people a few weeks ago, a man and his niece. They... I don't know what they are, but they know things, have access to things normal people don't. When I was done helping them, the niece told me to let them know if they could ever return the favor. Somehow I knew right away that they could help me find you. It took some time, but they found out enough to help me understand what I was looking for and how to find it, how to find you. I caught motion at the corner of my eye and looked around the dining room. All the customers, including my family, were staring at us now. A shiver crawled up my spine as I looked back at the man and at my brother. Where are we? He'd noticed the new attention we were getting, and his voice was tight with tension when he spoke again. There are stories of things, angels, that came down to earth and bred with people created monsters that didn't belong in this world or any other. That's what they'd read, but they didn't believe it. The uncle, my brother, Michael, uh, Mika. He held at the back of his hand and pointed at a small bump underneath the skin. You see this? This is a BB you shot me with when you were like six. It's always there, and over time it's moved around some, but it doesn't really belong there. He said, this place, this thing we're in, it's like that. It moves around under the skin of the world like a BB or a tumor. Sometimes it breaks the surface. I don't know why. Maybe just to trick someone inside. 
My mind was racing in a dozen different directions, but something else had begun to sink in. Did you say you've been looking for me for 23 years? Mika nodded at me sadly. Yeah, I... Yeah, I have. I'm so... A dozen chairs scraped loudly around us. The others were all rising to their feet. Mika froze for a second and then began reaching into his suit jacket. His voice tight but steady as he spoke in low tones. This thing is sick, I think, maybe even dying. Otherwise, I don't know if I could have even gotten back in once I found it, but that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. If anything, it will fight harder to keep you, maybe keep us both now. He pulled out a bundle of folded cloth and sat it on the table in front of us. He looked at the bundle and then back at me. I don't know what's in here. They said I shouldn't see it until I was ready to use it. That if I knew anything about it, that this place, this thing, might be able to see it in my mind and stop me. But I'm about to open it now. So when I'll do, I'll try to use it if I can. And if it works, you have to be ready to run. He licked his lips and gave me a smile. And you don't stop running until you're out and safe. Okay? I wanted to ask more questions, but I knew there was no time. The others were just standing and watching, listening, but that could change any moment. So I just nodded. Returning my nod, he reached for the bundle of cloth and began to open it. They won't attack if they can avoid it, because they want to maintain the dream. He glanced over at the people, and I still had trouble not seeing as my wife and children. Isn't that right, fuckers? But we have to be. He lifted the last layer and revealed a large needle filled with a dark brown liquid. Without hesitating, he picked it up and slammed it into the table, pushing the plunger down. Immediately, the things around us began to squeal and shift as the room seemed to flicker and start melting around us. Grabbing my hand, Mika stood up and screamed for me to run. The people weren't people anymore, but instead were gray versions of the fat worms he'd described. They lunged at us feebly as we passed, their skin cracking and oozing with the effort as they flopped and flailed after us. My stomach rolled as everything around us changed over and over again. A restaurant, a house, a pink fleshy cave, a gas station. The air was growing hot and thick and I felt my hand grow slick in Micah's as my heart started to pound harder. It was going to keep me. Keep us. I had to. When the cool air hit me, the shock took my breath away. I stumbled as I began to gasp, but Mika kept me on my feet, grabbing my elbow and pulling me forward. We were in the middle of an old, cracked asphalt parking lot, and fifty feet away was a pickup truck. Don't stop until we're in the truck. Sucking in new air, I kept going, my legs shaking with every step. I felt so weak and slow now, like I'd been sick a long time and was just starting to move around again. I almost fell again, but... Mika yanked me back up and pushed me forward before opening the door and helping me climb into the pickup. We didn't stop driving for an hour. By the time we did, I had more of my memory back. We finally stopped in the next town and he called our parents and I started crying when I heard their voices for the first time since, well, a very long time. That was six weeks ago, and I write this now both to record what happened to me, to us, and to reassure myself it's all finally over. I have a lot to learn, a lot to catch up on. I have to build a life in a world I've been away from for so long. And even now there are times I dream about the lives I lived in the belly of that monster. If I ever miss them... I don't mention that to Mika or even admit it to myself. Instead, I'm focused on what's to come and all I have to be grateful for. I want to make the most of my second chance, and that includes helping others the way I've been helped. 
That's the other reason I'm writing this. As a warning. There are places and things that live underneath the skin of this world, and just because you don't see them or even believe them, doesn't mean they aren't real. So be careful. Be smart. Don't trick yourself into thinking nothing exists outside of our little bubble of reality. Because the things you don't see or believe can swallow you whole. I want to give a quick thank you to all my patrons and members. Absinthe Alice, Alice E, Amethyst, Ahmed, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Furious Weasel, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrot Cat, Lee Riggs, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Nicholas Moore, Nikki Parsons, Nova Nocturne, Ray Clegg, Centennial, The New Ongoing 24, Tiger Princess, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for your continued support.